Okay, so I'm going to talk about this um, AI competition that we're currently running. It is, it's currently live. You can download the code, you can enter, um, you can try and win a share of our $32,000 of prizes. And the whole point behind the competition is to take tests from animal cognition literature and make the translation from tests that are normally performed on animals and change them so that we can perform them on AI and give them to the AI community as a challenge, asking them, well, can you solve these same tests that we know that animals can solve? So they're cognitive tests. We're looking at tests that are, are trying to test for certain cognitive abilities, the ability to understand the environment in certain ways. Um, I'll go into a bit more detail about that later. Um, my background is, um, well, first symbolic planning and then some robotics work and then slowly transitioning into cognitive science and philosophy of mind. So quite a varied background. And at the moment, I'm working at this um, Leverhulme Center on a project called Kinds of Intelligence, where we're looking at all the, diff the space of possible minds and the space of different types of intelligence that can exist. We know that we have human intelligences and animal intelligences, and we have, to some extent, artificial intelligences. And they look very, very different to the types of intelligence that inhabit the, um, the biological space. Uh, so part of what I'm doing is trying to like, compare these things and bring them closer together so we can have a conversation and see what the differences are, and hopefully while doing so, learn more about human-like and biological intelligence. Um, so unfortunately, I've got to start with a bit of a disclaimer, which is this competition is live at the moment, and one of the premises of the competition is that all the tests in the competition are uh, hidden from the participants. So I can't actually go into any details about the exact contents of the tests, but um, I can talk a lot about like, what has inspired them and the kind of things that are in them, because we want to give out as, as much information as possible as, as, as to the kind of thing people are going to have to solve. But unfortunately, I, I have to, there's a few details that I just can't cover until the whole thing is over. It ends in the um, beginning of November. Uh, then we present the results at Europe in December. And at that point, everything's going to be released and made public. Um, and so here are some of the people involved. Um, Murray Shanahan, who's working at DeepMind, has been helping understanding limitations of AI and what is interesting to test. Uh, Benjamin's been doing a lot of the implementation work. Uh, Lucy and Marta work on animal cognition, comparative cognition. They've got that background for us. And um, Jose's like, literally written a book on how to measure intelligence. Um, so they've all been um, supporting this endeavor. Um, for this talk, I'm going to spend a bit more time than usual on the animal cognition side, because I assume this audience is a bit less familiar with that. Other versions of this talk will spend more time on the machine learning side. But I probably don't need to do that here. Um, I'm going to talk about why we think the competition is important and why it's an interesting thing to do, and then explain exactly how it works, what the environment we've built looks like, what the tests involve, although, as I said, I can't tell you exactly what's in them, and then go over some of the challenges between translating between them, because you actually learned a lot in this process of building the competition about what is very different between how animals can like, exist and do stuff in their world and the limitations of current uh, machine learning, deep learning systems. Um, so yeah, I'll start with some background in animal cognition. Um, we don't really understand, I mean, as a research field, exactly what's going on in animals' heads, what kind of cognition, cognitive abilities exist. Uh, here's a canonical kind of experiment um, that's been formed. Um, the idea is that is there a task from Aesop's Fables, uh, the crow has to put a rock in the correct tube. You can see one of the tubes, the tube on the left, has water in it. The tube on the right has sand in it. And there is food uh, at the top of the tube, at the top of the water, or on top of the sand. And if you can work it out, if you put the rock in the sand tube, not much happens. You just land on top of the food. If you put it in the water tube, then eventually, through displacement, the food will rise, and the crow will eventually be able to get the water. And um, we can see the crow being successful in this case. It doesn't bother with any unnecessary actions. It doesn't take the rock up and put it in the, the wrong tube. Um, it may not be the most efficient. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about that in a second. <laughs> but it eventually gets it to a level that it can get the food and eat it. And, eat it. and there's a lot of tests, and almost all animal cognition tests are based on this one fact that animals are very motivated by food. Um, <laughs> A lot of them, you, <laughs> a lot of them, I mean, unfortunately, it's, they work better if you deprive them of food a little bit before the tests and make sure they're really motivated to food. Um, but then you can find out, see what kinds of tests they can solve. And, and as corvids are one of the more sort of intelligent animals, they can solve a lot uh, more complicated tests than other animals. That's, that's, this is an example of a fairly complicated animal cognition experiment and the kind that we're not going to be able to recreate right now in an AI competition. 
Um, but yeah, to go back to a bit of discussion and answer your question, um, there's a lot of discussion. Well, when this was first uh, came out, it was considered, oh, this is clearly a crow that understands water displacement, and that's what's going on. And then a lot of more recent discussion has come up with lots of ways where you could end up solving this problem without actually any real understanding whatsoever. And if you're performing the experiment, I've been told by someone who has performed these experiments, it's a very useful thing to do is to, you need to train the animal a bit. You can't just put it in there the first time and hope that it's going to solve that kind of problem. Um, so it's very useful if you put some little rocks right on the edge of the top of the test tube so it might accidentally knock one in and see what happens. If you don't do that, it might take a lot longer before it starts to like, experiment and see what's going on. So there's been a lot of facilitation going on in the background to end up with this video. And um, another thing people have suggested recently in, in this paper that's linked to the bottom is, well, when you drop the heavy item in the water, the food gets closer to you. And that's rewarding to a crow, crow like food getting close to them. And it, maybe it's just learning an association between doing this particular action, which it doesn't understand, and food getting closer. And therefore, it repeats the action. And maybe that's the best explanation for what's going on. And traditional in um, animal cognition is like based on uh, Morgan's canon, which says, basically, if there's an easy explanation for a phenomena, instead of like a high-level cognitive explanation, then the easy, like, low-level process is probably what's, what's going on. Um, so I still think these tests are very interesting, but that one's like very, very, very complicated. That's for an exemplar of what animals can do, and we cannot start there for a test for AI. That's just not going to translate. And some other people have suggested that if in, this is in the context of consciousness, so Henry Shevlin and Murray Shanahan have these graphs where they plot uh, human likeness and consciousness or intelligence and consciousness. And you'll see that what they do, and this is obviously very crude and not meant to be exact, is there's sort of a ladder of animals in both of these graphs where you can start with very, very simple animals and sort of move up the scale towards uh, the other end humans or in the very top right corner of, of both of the graphs. And perhaps you're not interested in consciousness, and these are obviously very speculative when they're talking about consciousness, but if you're interested in just human likeness or having a mind or just what it's like to be something that intelligently understands its environment, then climbing up this ladder seems to me to be a very reasonable thing to want to do. And so if you want to create AI systems in the future that behave in some way or act in some way or internally are working in some way like biological creatures, then climbing up from very, very simple things that simple animals can do to the more complex seems like a sensible place to start. Um, so the background on artificial cognition um, is we don't understand, I said before, we don't understand um, animal cognition. We, we don't understand artificial intelligence with the emphasis on intelligence, um, but we really don't understand uh, artificial cognition. That's something, I mean, those two terms don't necessarily even go together yet. Um, but what I want to do with this is try and bring them together so we can at least start having a conversation about what it would mean to have systems that are, are artificially uh, cognitive agents. And I think progress is important in this for, for multiple reasons. Uh, one, I think it's a very plausible pathway to better AI. We know that like, evolution has come up with very efficient solutions for solving problems and creating systems that can exist independently in the real world and survive in unknown environments that they could never have expected um, to exist. Um, so it's a very efficient way of encoding information and um, sort of achieving your goals in the world. Um, I think it can also teach us about human cognition. Um, uh, Richard Feynman's uh, famous um, phrase that what I cannot create, I do not understand. I think it's important if we can build these things, we will learn more about what's going on in the human cases. Slow, this is going to be a very slow process as we slowly climb this ladder, but I think it's going to be useful for understanding what's going on in the actual human brain. And finally, I think this is an important step towards transferring successes in AI to the real world and robotics and stuff like that, because a lot of the problems, as you'll see, are based on interaction and navigation, in this case, in a very simplified environment. But um, at the moment, we're still not at the point in robotics where you can create a robot that can survive in an unknown environment with like, unknown unknowns and things happening that it just hasn't expected, whereas animals are very, very good in these kind of things. They might not do the most intelligent thing, but at least they will do some kind of behavior that shows that they've got at least a vague understanding of what's going on. Um, yeah, so another point is a biological cognition is scaffolded on the sensory processing. The, the crow we saw earlier is solving the problem based on um, just data coming in from it through its eyes, through its senses. And I think a really interesting test and question that's being posed by the, the competition is that um, we're going to start everything from the same sort of sensory processes. We're just using vision. And from vision alone, you have to build up the ability to solve simple um, cognitive problems. And of course, this is, this, is, this is a very, very challenging thing for AI at the moment. So if we go back to this video again, to even just to start solving this problem, imagine you had to create a sort of mini um, 
animal robot to solve it. First of all, you need to detect that there's food inside a transparent container. The, the query obviously never goes to peck at the side of the container in the video. It's learned already not to do that. That's actually quite challenging itself, the reflection of, of the light off these kind of things, to know something's inside something. You need to know that there's holes in the top. You need to know that there's different substances in the containers and that they have these different qualities. You need to know that there's objects that can be picked up, and you need to solve the problem of actually picking up those objects, which um, is still an open problem in robotics of how to grasp a sort of objects of unknown shape or size. And that's not to mention, actually, any of the stuff that might be going in to solve this cognitively. All those previous things are just how to interact with the world. But if you actually have to do the process of, oh, I understand doing water displacement, displacement, that's something on top of all this other stuff. But as, as I said, that might not be going on inside the animal. But if we want to solve it in that way, that would be an extra dimension. Um, Fortunately, there are many easier tasks that we can start with. And here's another example that I can talk about, because again, it's not in the competition, and it's not in the competition because it's slightly too complicated for, for now. Um, this task is called the A not B task. It's, it's a very, very simple setup. You have three cups with food in, and one thing you'll notice in this video is that it's been tested on many, many, many different types of animals. So the test translates really well. Um, you just need a cup. It can be an, an opaque object, and it can be different sizes for different animals. It can work depending on whether the animal reaches for food with arms or with a trunk or with another type of its body. Um, and the idea is you put food in, say, the left cup um, over and over and over again and train the animal until it can pick out food from that same cup. <laughs> and then once, it's, once it can do that reliably, and it's just been doing that multiple times in a row, in the very final test, you can, as you'll see they're doing here, you take it out of that cup it's been trained to know the food is under, and then move it to another cup. And you have to make sure the animal's paying attention, because often they'll just look the other way. And, but you have to make sure that they've noticed you do it, and then you see where they get it. So the first half of that video is um, animals doing well. Uh, I don't know if I can skip to it forwards on here. Uh, I'll find another way to show it. Um, I should not have done it this way. I'll show it at the end. The second half of the video is um, animals failing this um, task. And this um, animal, for example, here, the domestic dog, which you'd think might be one of the more intelligent animals, it's unfortunately not, uh, not the best. Actually, maybe if I do this, I can show you. Yes. Um, so here we go. I'll just leave it that size for now. <laughs> and my favorite one at the end. As you, as you can see, the nice thing is that the task looks very different when performed with lots of different animals, which really helps us. Like a lot of animal cognition tests are set up this way. And um, what that means is that um, when we translate it into the AI setting, we, we don't have to, we do too much extra work to make an abstract version of it because it's already something that's built to be designed in multiple different ways. Um, so, um, some of the major differences between what we are doing and uh, what is done in animal cognition or when you want to move from animal tests to AI tests. Um, animal tests, of course, they happen in real time. The environment doesn't pause and wait for the animal to come up with the next action before it makes an action. Whereas standard in deep learning, or deep reinforcement learning at least, is you use synchronous environments. So I will give you an input from the environment and I wait until you perform an action. The environment will just sit there idling, doing nothing, and then you can do whatever you want to do, give me back an action, then I'll take the next step and then give you an another input again. Um, and we're doing something, we're using the standard paradigm. We want to make this as accessible possible, as possible for people who research in deep reinforcement learning and other similar um, areas. Uh, so we're using a synchronous environment. But it is timed. There is a set amount of time you have to complete all, the, all our tasks. And we have uh, 300 tasks in the full competition. So you can't just go away and do hours of comput computation and then come back with each action in between each step. Um, Secondly, animal has access to all its senses to try and solve problems, and you'll often find that a lot of tests in animal cognition don't work the way you'd expect them to because you didn't realize the animal could smell the food, for example. And it turns out smelling the food is a really good way to, for example, locate it through a maze when you're expecting the animal to just do it by vision alone and they can't see it the whole time. So most food in animal cognition experiments has to be very carefully uh, selected or treated so that it doesn't smell so that they can't um, use this. Um, we're restricted to vision only, but um, as I've said, that's already a, quite a challenge. The inputs to our competition are just pixels from a, a simulated environment, 84 by 84 um, RGB. And um, that's already a lot to go in. And we're also giving some velocity information as well. 
Um, animals require the ability to navigate their full body, and we're just using um, non-embodied sort of agents. It can move around. It has some affordances based on its body shape, but it's a very, very, very simple agent, so that simplifies things again. Animals are, as I said, are almost always motivated by food, and we've done the same thing in our competition. We've de developed a simulated environment where the only things that reward you are food, and that's very constant what it is, these green circles you'll see, are food every time, and all the tests, all 300 tests, are based on your ability to retrieve food from the environment, just like the animal cognition tests are based on the ability of the animal to retrieve food from certain scenarios. Um, and then there's just lots of things that appear. So the A not B test involves a learning phase. The crucial thing you're trying to test for is inhibitory control of the animal. Can, can it inhibit the learned response of going to A over time with the new information that the food might have moved to, um, to B or to C? Um, whereas we can't do that because just at the state of machine learning at the moment, we can't expect anyone who enters our competition to submit an agent that can learn online um, during a few, only a few trials. So we're giving the environment out to people to train offline and then they submit an agent that's fully trained and is trying to solve all our tests um, the first time it sees them. Which, that, again, there's a lot of animal cognition experiments that we can translate that use that paradigm, but we still miss out quite a few. And we also miss out anything involving languages or symbols, because, again, that's a bit too complicated to include for something that we want to be based on navigation and built bottom-up from pixels. And finally, um, no social learning yet. But hopefully in the future, once people solve the first version, uh, we can move on to include all these kind of things. Um, yeah, another interesting thing about the difference is that the animals, of course, they don't know they're being tested. They're just like put in an unfamiliar place and they just try and get food like they always try and do. Uh, obviously, our agents that are entered into the competition won't know that they're being tested, but they're being designed specifically to solve a competition. They're doing, designed specifically to try and solve these um, problems. So that's why we're trying to be so careful about keeping them hidden to try and reduce this disparity between the two different types. Um, and also, it's actually not true that not all animals know it's a test. Once an animal's been in a laboratory for a long enough time, the, the chimps and so on, and more, more intelligent ones, they do start to know that they're being tested, and they do start to play around with this fact. And they, will, they might learn that certain types of tests end early if they make the wrong choice, and that they won't, can't expect it to continue after a certain amount of time. Um, so there is a bit of correlation there, because our tests, for example, end after a certain amount of time has passed. Um, so yeah, so what we build is basically a simplified enrichment environment. Um, and so an enrichment environment is something you might put an animal in prior to testing just to get it used to the kind of apparatus. So as you saw from the video, a lot of apparatus and animal cognition is built out of whatever is found lying around. Often people use Lego or like plastic things or like make things themselves out of wooden nails. And so people are put in, animals are generally put in this environment to sort of understand it. And what we've tried to build is a similar kind of environment as a simulated environment for people to train their agents in. So it only has a few different types of things that can exist in it. It's a, very, it's a set area um, which can have walls, immovable objects, or walls, ramps that you can move up and down so you can um, do things involving gravity and like going in the air or higher levels and tunnels. We have movable objects, some um, cardboard boxes that can be pushed around by the agent and some different shaped ones um, to make things a bit more interesting. And then we have the rewards, which is just food, um, green is good and ends the uh, experiment. Yellow is good and the experiment continues. And red is bad and ends the experiment. And then um, two types of zones, which are these areas on the floor that you'll see. Red is bad, ends the experiment. Or orange is bad and doesn't end the experiment. And that's it. All the, exper all the experiments in, our, in the competition are built just out of these objects. Um, so what I'm going to do now is a quick demonstration of the environment um, we don't technically support Windows, and this is a Windows machine. <laughs> uh, hopefully, everything's going to work. Um, but yeah, now this is the first time you get to see what it actually looks like. So it's built with ML agents in Unity. Um, uh, here's an example shown from above. Um, this is just an arena spawned with a lot of random objects in, one of each different random object that we have. And the agent is in the top right corner. It's this blue thing, and I'm controlling it myself right now just with the keyboard. And I only have it on that screen, so I'm not controlling it very well. And from the agent's perspective, it looks like this. And this is roughly the inputs that the agent's going to get. They get H4 by H4 pixels. It's a bit smaller than this and lower resolution. But you can get a lot of the same information. Um, and then that big yellow thing is the yellow food that doesn't end the environment. So if I go and get that, you should see the reward on the left increases. And then the green thing is good, and the red thing is bad, and they would both end the environment. So if you were if you knew what you were doing, you would go towards the green one and get it. And then we just spawn another random one. So you can. 
We've given people configuration files so they can basically spawn whatever they want and build whatever they want out of the environment. So if I just keep spawning random ones, you'll see this is just putting random things, random sizes inside the environment. And some of the food is stationary, some of it's moving around. But in all cases, the goal is move around, try and stay off this orange thing because it's giving you a slow negative reward, and get the food. And all the tests are built just out of these kind of building blocks. Um, so that's an example of um, just all the things uh, randomly. Um, here I'll show you the kind of thing that you can build in, in this kind of environment. Um, so just by putting objects on top of each other and stacking a lot of them together, um, as long as you put them in the right places, you can build things like, for example, this house, which the agent can uh, move around. And I'm not going to be able to control it from here very well, but go inside and then go upstairs. And then there's some food on the top stairs and this, and this little um, tree on the outside that you can look out through the, through, through the window. And this is just an example to show that um, we're not very limited in the stuff that we can actually translate from animal cognition. If someone can build it and put it in front of an animal, we can build it in this arena and put it in front of the agent. So there's, not, there's very little uh, that we can't do. Uh, we're just uh, mainly um, need to keep things simple just so that actually possible for some people to solve some of our problems. Because as they haven't seen them before, this is going to be, these are very, very challenging things. So here's a, just an example of one of the elements of the environment. Um, the walls can be any color, but just for simplicity, every time there are a wall that's immovable that you can't get past, they're going to be gray. And this is a wall underneath me, which is acting as a platform. And whenever it's blue, that means that if I go off it, I can't go back. So if I fall off this platform, I'm not going to be able to get back up. And I have to make my choice of which of one of these quadrants um, I should go around. And I'm hoping everyone's paying enough attention in the audience to know which is the correct answer here. Um, but yeah, and if I go up and if I try and go back up, I can't do it. I can't climb back up this thing. So we can use that kind of thing to replicate forced choice experiments in animal cognition, where um, things get a bit more complicated than just an environment with some random objects placed around that has some, have some food perhaps behind something or something. Um, so as I said, there's a, a 300 tests. Um, these are split into 10 different categories. They start from very, very simple. We're very worried that this is going to be a, a big challenge for AI. So they start very, very simple things, just you and some food in the environment. And each one of these categories has 30 different tests in it. And they sort of slowly ramp up in difficulty. So food, just food, preferences, good food, bad food. Sorry, just a question on yeah. the previous example. How does the agent know from the pixels that it's, this is a one way? So the. The only time that a blue object appears in the environment as a platform underneath the agent, it, it will be a one-way platform. So you can learn that over time, but, but it's, a, it's kind of a hard thing to, it's a hard problem to solve. But it's not learning in the same way that an animal would learn, you know, learn that if, if I go, down, go on this uh, platform, which kind of is going to move after I step off it, it's going to move. It, it, it's not, you can't reason using the physics of the environment. To, to, to no. It, it's, it's, it is using the physics of the environment in a sense in that you can tell that it's higher up just from the pixels. You can tell that, okay. And um, when you, you can't go up things that are not ramps, and all the ramps are also a different color. So we're giving as much information as possible so that it is possible to solve that just via vision. Like, as, I haven't tested this. Uh, we're going to do the tests on small children at some point. Um, <laughs> I've only done this on friendly small children <laughs> that I know. And they can solve these kind of problems and come to understand that fairly, fairly easily. So, and they're obviously just using the the visual input from the, uh, from the environment. So it's something that it should be learnable, but um, that it, it also is challenging. Um, yeah, so back to the categories, if we, we then start to introduce ones with obstacles involved, and then um, eventually towards the bottom, we end up with like, some of the more exciting animal cognition tests um, that involve a little bit of causal reasoning. And as I've emphasized throughout, these are very, very, very simple tests. So even the little bit of causal reasoning involved is, is very, very trivial causal reasoning from a seven-year-old's perspective. Uh, but from the perspective of trying to solve this problem that you don't know exactly what the test looks like in machine learning, this is obviously a, a huge challenge. And we'd just be very, very excited if one team at some point over the next three and a half months solves just one or two of these problems right at the bottom. Um, as I'll show you in just a second. So here's the results so far. We've only been live for a week or week, two weeks now, I think. Um, uh, the top right at the moment is a hand-coded agent that I wrote in about two and a half hours. Um, there's no machine learning involved. It's just, it simply, it takes the pixel inputs, looks for things that qualify as green. If there's more green things on the left than the right, it goes forwards and left. If there's more green things on the right than the left, it goes forwards and right. There's a little bit of extra stuff going on there. It moves away from red stuff. Um, but that's basically it, and that gets 28.3% uh, of our tests. 
and you can see it's split on the category. So basically what that does is it gets all the really, really, really easy ones, because there's a lot of easy ones there just to make sure people can actually solve some of these. And then I guess a few of the ones later on that are based on, well, we've got a few collections where if you sort of guess right or you get lucky, you'll get it right. But what we're really interested in from a, a cognition perspective is someone that can get all, all like six of a category correct. So it might pick up two in a category, um, but that doesn't display any type of intelligence. That's just obviously luck. Um, and so that's kind of a nice baseline, I think, for something that's clearly not doing anything intelligent. Um, that's what you'll get. Uh, human baseline is 100%, um, when I do it at least. Um, I think it will be a bit less um, when we perform it on small children, but I'm expecting somewhere in the 80s or 90s. Um, but what would be really excited is, well, we're going to be really excited the first time someone beats our hand-coded thing. Um, all the other things on this list are either people have entered or, well, there's our baseline in second place at the moment, which is um, PPO trained on an environment that just has random obstacles appearing. Uh, that does worse than the hand-coded one. Um, but it does better on a, like a few of the categories, at least. Um, and it can actually go around objects and explore for stuff a little bit. Although when you look at it, it wasn't, this, this was you know, a very pre preliminary baseline. We didn't put too much effort into optimizing this. We just ran it so we could get it out there and have it ready for the competition. There's no hyperparameter search or anything. It's just running basically PPO out of the box um, on our environment. And then the entries below are people who've already entered in the first week or two of the competition. Um, we expect those to get a, a lot better as time goes on. And I think all of those are using machine learning of some form. Um, so here's just an example of what my hand-coded agent looks like. It spins around when it sees nothing. It moves towards green things. When suddenly there's more red things in its environment than green things, it turns around. When there's red things just on one side of it, it moves forwards, which helps it go around red things. And it happens to get very lucky on that one and solve it in a way that, uh, if you didn't know actually how it was coded, you might think was some kind of intentional behavior. Um, but actually, it's just um, more dumb luck and a slight bit of... Um, ingenuity in how it responds to having red things on one side of it compared to the other. And this is how it performs in a sort of more chaotic environment with just lots of food moving around. It prioritizes yellow things over green things because yellow things don't end the environment, so therefore it's going to get more reward. Um, and this is, again, just another example of one where it happens to do fairly well in. It's um, not particularly um, intelligent agent, agent, but this is, this is like the challenge we want to give out to the machine learning community is, you should be able to do better than this. Like, you should be able to take our environment. Um, it's very, very simple. Um, you just go and get the green thing. Um, the green thing might be hidden behind something, but it's like nothing too much more complicated than that. Um, and you should be able to do much, much better than this. And you should be able to get to the level of some of the like, less intelligent animals that we've taken experiments from. So there's experiments done on uh, nematodes. There's experiments done on guinea pigs in there. There's experiments done on all kinds of animals. And at the moment, no one has solved any of the experiments in a way that suggests that they've got to the level of any of these animals. Um, how are we doing for time? Are we good? Um, so yeah, there's some major differences between what we're doing now and what is a standard paradigm in machine learning, or especially in more in deep reinforcement learning type uh, competitions or, or, um, or testing sets or test beds. Um, in standard in um, de reinforcement learning that your training and test set are drawn from the exact same probability distribution. You, you take one, you train on it, and then what you're testing on, you expect to be very, very similar to the thing you've trained on, just held out examples from the exact same uh, probability distribution. Um, we haven't exactly got that. We've got very, very specifically designed tests. All the tests have objects in very specific places trying to emulate animal cognition tests and trying to test for very specific skills and understanding of the environment. Um, but they are all fair. Like We give people the ability to make their own configurations and make their own environments to train on. And technically, if someone was ingenious enough or lucky enough, they could just design all the tests that are in our tests and train on those and do one on those. We haven't given out the information for that, so the chance of it actually happening is close to zero. But it is possible. Like There's nothing hidden. There's nothing cheating going on here. You can just design all the same tests that are being tested on and, and train on them if you like. Um, yeah, so standard machine learning has no unfair surprises because of this. You, you, you know, what you get tested on at the end is going to be something you could reasonably have expected to be in your training set, whereas that's not the case here. Um, and there is a potential for, I mean, because no one knows the test until they're released at the end, there's a potential for them, some of them to include tricks, like, oh, suddenly the food is a different color, or suddenly the gravity works differently, or suddenly there's a thing that you fall off that you didn't think, you know, that wasn't blue, or, or there's lava that, or a red reward hidden behind a corner. But um, they've all been carefully designed so that this shouldn't be the case. Um, if there is one of, or two of the 300 where that's not true, that's just my fault. Um, it should not be the case. They should all, they're all just designed to be very simple tests in which you um, 
if you did solve them, would understand at least some property of your environment or the physics of your environment. Um, and this leads to other problems, like training might not always be useful because you don't know if you're heading towards the right goal. But you can upload your agent online now, and it will automatically be tested on our tests, and we'll give you feedback on how well you've done. So that's what the, um, the results I showed you in this slide are. People who are submitting online, um, and they're getting their results in, in real time. Well, it takes a few hours potentially to run. Um, but we're only letting people do that once a day because we don't want them to overfit to the hidden tests at all in, in, in any way. Um, and yeah, another thing is this, so this is a sort of different paradigm for doing machine learning research and especially for um, competitions. But we think this is a good thing and we think this is something that machine learning at the moment is sort of very much struggling on. And these are, a lot of these are very, very easy problems performed like 100% success rate with very, very simple animals. Um, so we hope that um, we can push research direction into a way that's going to solve these kind of problems. Um, so yeah, we hope that we'll provide some data at the end of this and context and motivation for climbing this animal cognition ladder I was talking about. Um, we, the great thing we can do right at the end is do this comparison between how well the animals perform and how well all the artificial agents perform, and hopefully we'll get some very exciting results. We've also had a couple of groups who work in animal cognition who are excited to take our simulated environment and use it in virtual reality on the animals. So you have some types of chimps can um, be trained to use a joystick and move around, like basically just looking at a screen that's showing our environment, but also you have virtual reality for mice, for example, that are running around on 360 degree treadmills. And all we need to add in is some detection of whether they've hit a wall in the environment and that will stop the treadmill and then they can just basically run through our 300 tests. Yeah, so we're very excited about uh, getting the results for that, although that might be quite a while in the future. Um, I think this is a good benchmark for measuring AI progress, especially if you're interested in cognition or what it's like to be a thinking being or have a mind, or especially if you're interested in AI progress that's moving towards real-world applications in terms of robotics or things that can um, potentially exist autonomously in unknown environments and make interesting uh, survival like food uh, retrieval or exploration, exploratory behavior. Um, also, this cuts through some of the AI hype. Part of the uh, Center for Future Intelligence work is um, sort of cutting through this hype and like taking a more, a less sort of uh, excited look at some of the progress in AI at the moment. And we've seen already that the, I mean, performance on these tests is, is very, very minimal at the moment. And until we solve those, I don't think we're going to have to be worried about some of the issues that the uh, popular media is worried about in AI. Um, it will show where some progress hopefully has been made when someone um, enters something interesting that can solve some of these problems. We've got many different categories and many different types of tests, and some of them should be easier than others. So we'll see what approaches work well. I'm kind of excited. Approaches that involve some kind of intrinsic motivation or curiosity will be entered in, and they will do well at certain types of our problems. Uh, but we'll just have to wait and see. Um, yeah, so which approach is uh, best suited to which cognitive task, as I said. And also facilitate communication between animal cognition and, and machine learning. And we can hopefully have like, more discussion in the future and more work that sort of speaks with the same um, language and can talk to each other and take things that they've learned from one community to the other. So what I found, I was sort of coming new to animal cognition for, for all of this. One of the main things I found is some of the experimental designs, which unfortunately stuff I cannot show you until after December, are really ingenious. They've thought very, very, very hard about exactly how you design it so you rule out it being solved in a way that doesn't you know, involve the type of thinking that they're looking to test for. So there's lots of very, very, very simple, because they have to be tested on lots of different animals, and very clever, ingenious experiments. And I'm hoping that after this is finished and everything's released and made public, um, we can take these kind of ideas and translate them from animal cognition into AI community and start testing like, more often on these kind of problems. Um, but also, as we've seen in animal cognition, you find out that your test, often you find out that your test that seemed ingenious at first, there's a very simple explanation for how an animal can learn to solve it. Um, so there's sort of a cycle of new clever tests coming out and then ways those tests could actually be solved without involving too much like higher level cognitive thought. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see this progress and hopefully that can also move over to how AI works or AI research works in the area that's interested in more cognitive stuff. Um, so yeah, that's about it. I want to thank the sponsors who've helped us make this competition. If we didn't have them, we wouldn't have actually been able to build this whole thing and put it out there in front of the community. Um, as I said, yeah, we've got $32,000 total in prizes for this. At the moment, um, you can enter a random agent and you'll be qualifying for some of our prizes. Um, obviously, we're only a few weeks in and there's three and a half months left to go. So hopefully at the end, you'd need to enter a pretty good agent uh, to qualify for our prizes. Um, and so yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions.
Can you hear me? Oh, uh, thanks. Um, I was just wondering, those 10 categories you mentioned, were they constructed just for this specific challenge, or this, is this standard in the literature right now to assess on these categories for cognition? That's a, that's a good question. So they were, they were designed specifically for the competition, but they were designed based on conversation with and a lot of research into animal cognition. So they're based on a lot of categories that are used in animal cognition, but um, a few of them just don't really exist. So the food one, where there's just food, actually you do get a few tests where you just check if an animal is actually motivated by food where you, the way you think it is, but they're not particularly exciting, right? And uh, most all the tests in that category are just sort of fairly simple baseline tests to you know, make sure people are on the right track and to make sure that we are rewarding food retrieval as because they're all based on food retrieval. So we want to put the agents on the same like, playing field as the animals and be really motivated by food. So the only thing that gives you reward in the environment is food. Another one on there, the in, internal models one, um, there are actually a few experiments where you basically put an animal in a situation and uh, turn the lights out and see if it can still do what it was planning to do. And we've mainly included this category because uh, Murray Shanahan's really, really interested in, like, sees this as a big sort of flaw with deep reinforcement learning at the moment, which is often you have methods that are just simply translating inputs into actions, and those methods just cannot work if you turn the lights out for a second. Um, so we want to include some. So those are very, very simple tests. Um, a lot of them are not fully inspired by animal cognition, so they don't translate. Uh, but then as you get towards the bottom, um, there's sort of subcategories within, within all the tests that there's a bit more information about online. But uh, again, I want to be a bit careful about exactly what we say. But then they're all really like, fully inspired by animal cognition tests and like, more exciting stuff that's going on. Right? Yeah. If I could just be really cheeky and add on one more to that. So if these categories already do sort of exist based on past conversation, is there any one there that we already really do quite well already and it's pretty much solved? Or in AI or in? Um, in general, AI, uh, from your experience. Yeah, so I think if, when people make us like serious, like we're getting more serious entries into the competition, the, the first category should be really easy. Like that's just getting a reward. Like you, train a, you can create an environment in our configuration which just has some random food spawning on it, train an agent to go and get the food and it should get close to 90% in that category very easily. Um, preferences, again, is also very, very fairly simple, and I expect that to be solved fairly easily. But the thing is, you're submitting one agent to this whole competition, right? So your one agent has to perform on all 300 tests. If we gave all, gave all the tests out individually, that would all be easy to solve, especially if you could train on them, then they're all trivial. Um, but the fact is, you, we want one agent that can solve all 300 of them, and you can't train on them. That makes them a lot more challenging. So, so, so one answer is, yeah, they're all easy to solve. But the, the really interesting thing here is that they, they, they don't know exactly what's going to be in them and haven't seen them before. And so they need to provide an agent that just can robustly go and get food in its environment and understands the affordances of its environment so it, so that it can learn to do that. Um, so one other thing on so the general, generalization category is basically just simple tests from all the previous categories, but with some of the colors uh, changed around. So it's just standard generalization for machine learning. Add a bit of noise to the environment to see if you can still solve the problems. And that one, I mean, it's a big research area at the moment. There's lots of methods that fail on this, but there's lots of people researching into how to solve these kind of problems. And it's also very big in robotics at the moment, like learning, translating from simulated environments to real environments. Often the real environments are a lot noisier and messier than the simulated ones. So you just add a lot of noise into your simulated environments, and that helps to transfer. So techniques like that should do quite well, I would expect. Yeah? So we have a question here as well. Yeah. I'm going to go first. Why did you publish in Nature Machine Intelligence? Because it's really difficult to get hold of the paper. Um, yeah. Um, Can I just request that you publish in an open access journal? Yeah, we will. Uh, <laughs> the reason is, it was, it's, not, it's not a long paper. It's just a short like, position piece about the competition. And the reason was, at the time, we were working pretty much, or me and Ben, who are the main people implementing everything, working pretty much flat out just to get this out, just to get the competition like designed and everything working in the background. And it was just an easy thing to do. They approached us, said they'd you know, publish a short thing. Um, it was easier to do than not. And we're not, I mean, we want our main paper about the competition to be in an open access journal. And our long paper that details everything is being written now that we finally released and we actually have some spare time. Um, and it will be, yeah. Great, great to hear. Hello. Oh, um, yeah, there's a big jump from the four um, avoidance, yes. which you did with red, and yes. then 
to spatial reasoning. I mean, does the agent understand simple physics? So, I mean, it was interesting to see that your, your, your agent itself, I think, scored on nine quite well. Um, and yet it got zeros. I mean, is it, you're, is that just, you're saying that's emergent behavior from your, your agent, but yes. I mean, that's almost like, I mean, uh, is your, is, is, are you expecting people's models to learn things? I mean, expecting a model to learn physics is, is you know, that, that's a, a big, big ask, really. So I'm like, I, I'm just wondering how you kind of, uh, they're not graded. I mean, it's, this is not at all a graded sort of thing. It's like the food one is easy, as you say, and then, then by the time you get to learning simple physics, that's a big jump. But then suddenly you had something that could, could, uh, could you know, that, but by nine, which is supposed to be at the really difficult level, in animal intelligence, you actually had something that scored quite well. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm just wondering if these, you know, this doesn't really kind of map to kind of the, the human, the, 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 the animal scale very well necessarily. That's so, what I'm trying to get to. So I think the main answer to your question is that the spatial reasoning category contains tests that are a lot simpler than you're probably imagining. Right. Um, this doesn't involve, does the agent understand simple physics? I could think of a sort of more complicated test would be stacking lots of boxes on top of each other in different ways to, that you have to approach in a very specific you know, way to knock them down or something like that. That's way too complicated for anything we'd expect anyone to, hold, to solve. This is more, do you understand that things roll down things? <laughs> do you understand that something moving continues to move without it hitting anything? Um, so that's, I, I guess, maybe perhaps an overly grand two-word title for, the, uh, for that category. That category, they are meant to be roughly in order of difficulty. Uh, the generalization one, I'm not sure where it exactly fits. And they also build on the previous ones, so they're sort of slowly introducing new elements. Um, but like one of the physical properties of the environment is gravity, for example. So you can expect the spatial reasoning tasks to have things at potentially different heights than the previous tasks and involve some ramps where the previous ones didn't. Um, it's, it's, that's not a huge leap in terms of like actually what the tests are, um, but I could see like if you actually understood spatial reasoning, yes, but that's not what we're trying to, we're, we're not trying to test for something that fully understands spatial reasoning. If someone enters an agent that passes all our tests, we've made a terrible mistake and should have made them more complicated, and then we can start doing the ones I think you have in mind that would go in there, which are, I think, much more exciting and interesting things, but we're just not ready for that yet. Uh, yeah, the back. So, so how much of this, uh, how much of the difficulty in this is actually training the agent and how much of it is actually exploring the space of environments? Because, you know, if you just generate random environments, they might not have the, the kind of structure that your environments do and the kind of movement and, and ramps and, and they might not connect properly. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I think, um, I don't know the exact answer, but I think uh, a huge amount of the difficulty is designing the correct environments. So if you, if you can... I mean, it's, it's, it's a tricky topic in machine learning at the moment, like designing curriculums for, for learning and like slowly moving between like understanding the very simple things and introducing things that are structured, but just structured in such a way that you don't forget previous things. Um, I think whoever does like well in this competition will have spent a lot of time working out how to design like a structured, like, I don't know, I don't know if they're going to use a single training set or if they're going to use some kind of curriculum learning based method. I mean, we want to leave this open to all possibilities. Um, but yeah, I think that's like, and that's kind of what I'm excited to see is whether people do submit really interesting configuration files, for example, for how, what they've tra we've trained on. And um, part of the paper we're writing at the moment, actually, is encouraging anyone, once this goes public, um, once it's public, you can see all the tests, so you can just train on them. And that's not very interesting if someone just trains on the tests. Um, is trying to sort of set out an agenda for what you should publish if you're working on this kind of thing. And one of the main things is you should publish what you decided to train on and how you designed your training environment and how that affected the results. So yeah, good question. Um, uh, do the agents just get one shot at each environment? Because there, there's no, no possibility of learning from, from their experience. Correct. I mean, like, like the crow, Correct. Was, that was not the first time it had seen those tubes and those stones and so, so on. So it's really hopefully not the first time the agent has seen the objects in its environment because you can train on it. You can build the environments. But it's the first time you've seen it in that particular configuration, unlike the crow. Um, we are running the test sequentially. Um, we, we're going to scramble the order of the categories at the end, just so that people don't just submit 10 different agents for each category. But we're going to run all the tests in them sequentially. So if you want to submit something that can learn online and can learn online fast enough that it doesn't time out in the two hours we allot to solve all our tests, uh, you can. 
But I mean, I think this is a hard enough challenge as it is that we don't expect many, if any, people to do that. Um, what I'm really excited to do, if this um, goes well and works out for the next year, is include, because there's so many animal cognition tests that involve training them on a very specific task and then changing around it, it around in a very clever way at the end to see if they actually understood what was going on or not, is to actually include that as part of the competition. So every single test will be like five training phases where it doesn't matter how well you do, whether you solve it or not, and then the sixth one is the one you're actually tested on. Um, but for the very first iteration of this competition, that just wasn't feasible. But I think that's probably the most interesting thing, like, next step. Great. Thank you, Matt. Fantastic talk. Um, I'll give you another round of applause, and then we'll go to the break. <laughs>